EA Games challenged everything. Today we're turning back the clock to November 9th, 2004, to revisit one of my favorite games of all time. It's the Herbs, Sims in the City. But wait! It's for Game Boy Advance. Of all the Sims spin-offs I've covered on this channel, this one is the zaniest, the wackiest, and the most bizarre one I've played, and I still find myself walking around my house humming its catchy tunes to myself to this very day. Like its prequel, Bustin' Out for GBA, this game was published and released by EA and Maxis, but developed by Gryptonite, a special game dev studio which also developed some of the Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter games for GBA, Nintendo DS, and the N-Gage. For ease of recording, I'll be doing the GBA version, though the DS version is objectively better. To be perfectly clear, this game is very sentimental to me, and despite its obvious limitations, I think it has the most heart of any game in the franchise. And I hope this video convinces you to dig up your old handheld and give it a try. Story Herbs, or urbanites, city dwellers, are the subject of this game's plot. The setting is the urban sprawl of Minneapolis, somewhere in the Sims universe. You are the protagonist, a working class window washer at King Tower, who's just vibing. One day out of the blue, your immediate supervisor, Chris Thistle, the head janitor at King Tower, breaks the unfortunate news that you've been canned. What is the meaning of this? How will you survive? A laughably goofy villain named Daddy Big Butts, who's not just mawkishly patronizing toward poor people like in Bustin' Out, but is now metamorphosed into a greedy, villainous tycoon, has acquired King Tower, and is planning on firing its staff, then bulldozing all of Minneapolis and replacing every building with an exact replica of itself, and charging everyone an entry fee to profit off of everyone living there who walks his streets drinks his water, and breathes his air. So right from the start, it's the haves versus the have-nots. This primary conflict sets in motion the events of the central plot. After a short series of quests where you trespass through King Tower to try to avoid moving out, Daddy Big Bucks catches you trespassing with your hand in the cookie jar and has you arrested by Detective Dan D. Man, a returning character from Bustin' Out, who's a friendly but also very uptight police officer. Fortunately, if you become friends with Officer Dan, you get to leave your jail cell early. And so commences the classic American quest of pulling oneself up by the bootstraps, fresh out of jail and with zero dollars to your name. After you get out of jail, Detective Dan offers you a job to be paid cash for shooting free throws every morning at 5 a.m. above the prison. Just where this money is coming from and why you're being paid to shoot hoops is unclear, but it sets off a chain of side quests about gaining skills, reputation, or rep points, and popularity with the local street people by befriending them. At its core, the herbs is about self-improvement, getting stronger, getting smarter, and getting paid more. I spent the first few weeks of the game lifting weights to improve at basketball and befriending the nerds at the university in the hopes that it would help me improve my skills to get better at my basketball job and other future jobs, since the whole purpose of life in the herbs is to earn money. You'll probably spend 99% of your time in this game trying to earn more and more money. After you raise enough capital and befriend some of the locals, Detective Dan lets you go free to buy your own apartment in the cozy slums of Minneapolis in the humble neighborhood of Urbania. But having an apartment comes with its own whole new set of responsibilities. Now I had to pay bills. And since I cheaped out on all of my furniture, now I had to repair it all the time. It made me more handy. But then again, on the other end of the spectrum, even the really expensive stuff can eat up a lot of time and maintenance too. Or even worse, since I lived in a lowly tenement, I was often robbed by burglars. My bed was stolen three times in only one week. The first chapter of quests in the game unlocked most of the early game career paths, where you help a doctor operate on a gnome in a mini game by spotting all of the combinations of medical symbols. And another game, where you're a late night comedian who's constantly dodging tomatoes, trying to tell a joke. The more tomatoes you dodge, and the more jokes you tell, the more you get paid at the end of the night. Most of the quests had me doing shameful things just to barely get by like asking the very scammy-looking Berkeley Claude for help fabricating a doctoral thesis to get into the university. But once I got to know the locals, like Crystal, whom I schmoozed out on the town, by taking her out for a $20 slice of pizza, 
I had penetrated my way into the urban life of the community. Wrapping up with the Urbania Chapter 1 quests, a crotchety old lady named Grandma Hattie approached me to help her arrange a protest to foil Big Bucks' plan and more urban development in Urbania to set it up as one big gift shop. It's genuinely exciting in this game after you do so much running around to see the other characters coming through for you and opening up new jobs, new parts of town, and new opportunities to help you raise your standard of living. Every quest comes with the promise of more money and more stuff. Once I got out of Urbania, I unlocked the harbor area of Minneapolis, containing market stalls, a fortune teller, and the museum, as well as being home to the iconic riverboat of Old Salty, who's another goofy rendition of a stereotypical sailor making his return from busting out. The quests in this chapter are similar to those of part one, injecting new economic life into a humdrum community that's about to be bought out by big bucks, and you're raising money to prevent the locals from selling out to him. Things like keeping the museum alive and preventing Old Salty from selling his riverboat, all of which eat up all your time, energy, and finances for the reward of more popularity, and the genuine appreciation of locals like Grandma Hattie, who insists that you come to the graveyard every night from midnight to 4 a.m. in order to prevent the intervention of Daddy Big Bucks or his shady lawyer, Lily Gates, from snooping on their grassroots community meeting. It all culminates in your perfect foiling of all of Daddy Big Bucks' plans in not only one, but two communities around town. At which point in time, the game takes a completely different direction that no one ever expected, and which made me very, very uncomfortable as a child. In a scene that's practically out of Huckleberry Finn, Big Bucks smites you with his expensive cane, then throws you into the river and dances like a loony maniac. You come to your senses after blacking out, now washed up on the shore beneath a willow tree in the reeds of a backwater bayou, greeted by two goofy and slightly hostile hillbillies, Crawdad Clem and Bayou Boo, who fear, resent, and distrust city folk and all the money and baggage they bring to their isolated bayou shack. A far cry from every locale heretofore visited in the game. Marooned and with no hope at return, this was when I learned as a child that I had an irrational fear of hillbilly life and swamps and bayous. It's kind of scary. The bayou is creepy. It's like a giant trash dump that absorbs all the global warming, radiation, and unintended environmental consequences of all the urban development going on in Minneapolis. It contains a very bizarre variety of encounters, like man-eating plants, three-eyed mutant toads, vampires, an alligator man, an impish fiddle-playing caricature of the devil, and more. Most of which appear hostile at first, but then turn out to be friendly. Perhaps the strangest is an apparition of Daddy Big Bucks you encounter inside the undergrowth of the dark tree, which the Bayou Brothers dare you to delve inside, with the vague promise that maybe if you complete enough of their dares, they'll show you the way out of the bayou and back to civilization through the catacombs. Glad to be back in Minneapolis, now you have access to the entire city, and most of the town is up in arms and outraged that Daddy B had the audacity to throw an adolescent into a river. Now you have access once again to King Tower, along with the Carnival, the high-rise apartment buildings and department stores, and the best stuff in Minneapolis. Alongside that, now you have a fan boat to explore the riverways that run alongside the town. And and there's all these weird secret areas, like Paradise Island, covered in palm trees to the north, as well as Nutria Island to the southeast, a little plot of land where tiny rodents pop in and out of the soil. One of the quests has you complete a simulated reality TV show, kind of like Survivor on Paradise Island, with its own series of quests and even trivia questions, or other goals, like trying to bother the other contestants on the island for huge cash prizes. I haven't even begun to mention all the secret entrances and bases in this game. You can literally climb down a ladder inside of a garbage can in one part of the city to access a secret base. There's a tunnel behind a poster in the prison that leads to the bayou. This game is frothing with secret areas, easter eggs, and even nostalgic little nods to the cheat codes from the original Sims game. Like the ninja salesman in a secret underground tunnel who sells you a milkshake called Rosebud, which prints simoleons out of thin air. By the final series of quests where you have to stop Daddy Big Bucks from using a time machine to go back to the 1800s and claiming all the land in Minneapolis for himself before the founding of the city, you'll genuinely feel like you've mastered all the secrets and ways of earning money in one of the most sprawling open world adventure games ever created for the GBA. And to think all of this was played on a handheld console powered by a battery and I experienced in the backseat of my mom's car as a kid. I won't spoil everything if you ever decide to try this one for yourself, but I still feel like I've hard 
hardly even scratch the surface of what this incredible game was all about. Anyway, I got kind of lost in nostalgia when I was making this video, so I feel like it was a bit all over the place, but that is to say, thanks for joining me to revisit a game that actually meant a lot to me at a very impressionable age. And as always, thanks to my patrons for supporting my endeavors here. I'm Ambiguous Amphibian. Until next time, my friends.